Good afternoon and welcome to today's IAC webinar, Pediatric Echo Quantification to Z or Not to Z. My name is Kelly Baer and I am the Creative Design Manager with Marketing Communications at IAC. Before we begin, I'd like to take a moment to review a few technical matters and let you know how you can participate in today's session. We would like today's webinar to be interactive, so we encourage you to submit questions. To do so, use the questions tab located on the left side of your screen. Please submit your questions anytime during the webinar, as we will be monitoring questions throughout the presentation, and we'll try to answer as many of them as possible during the Q&A period. Also on the left side of your screen is the Resources tab. Click this tab for a link to today's handouts, which include a PDF copy of these PowerPoint slides. Select each file name to download the handout. Lastly, in the lower left of the player, please note the Request Support button. If you experience any technical problems during this webinar, click this button. A technical expert will be there to assist you with any issues you may have. For those who like to take notes during the presentation, look to the right of the slides and click the Notes tab. There you will see a white text box where you can take notes on today's webinar. These notes will be emailed to you automatically at the end of the session. To be eligible for the ASE CEU credit, you must be registered, logged into this webinar, then complete the survey. The survey will appear on your screen automatically at the conclusion of the live session and also be available from the IAC webinars portal for three business days. If you are viewing this webinar in a group, Please be sure you are also individually registered and logged into this webinar on another computer or device so that we have record of your attendance today. Today's presentation is being recorded and will be posted at a later time for on-demand viewing. This webinar is a joint presentation of IAC and the Society of Pediatric Echocardiography. And now I would like to introduce today's guest presenter, Dr. Leo Lopez. Dr. Lopez is Medical Director of Non-Invasive Cardiac Imaging and Associate Chief of Cardiovascular Medicine at Nicholas Children's Hospital in Miami, Florida. He is board certified by the American Board of Pediatrics in Pediatric Cardiology. His clinical interests include seeing complex congenital heart diseases, as well as ventricular function and quality improvement in cardiac imaging. Dr. Lopez serves on the IAC Echocardiography Board of Directors representing the Society of Pediatric Echocardiography. And with that, I will now turn the webinar over to Dr. Lopez. Doctor? Thank you very much, Kelly. And hello, everyone. Um, thank you for joining us for this webinar. As Kelly said, we're going to talk about pediatric echo quantification and Z-scores. And a lot of what we're going to talk about revolves around this document that we published in the Journal of the American Society of Echocardiography in 2010 on recommendations for pediatric echo quantification, uh, which was also accompanied by this reference poster that we created at around the same time. This initiative for the guidelines document was undertaken as, a, as an adjunct to two other documents that were published by the American Society of Echocardiography. The first involves the recommendations for chamber quantification in adult echo, published by Roberto Lang and the Chamber Quantification Writing Group in 2005. And the second involves the guidelines and standards for the performance of a pediatric echo published by Wyman Lai and the ASC Pediatric Council in 2006. So as an introduction to the question of whether to Z or not to Z, I know it's a very catchy title, we know that echo quantification is critical in the clinical management of pediatric heart disease that distinguishing between normal and abnormal values is important uh, in terms of echo quantification, and that echo measurements are frequently used as outcome variables in clinical research studies. So in order to discuss pediatric echo quantification and the role of Z-scores, we'll talk about the following topics, optimization techniques in pediatric echocardiography, some of the challenges with specific protocols for pediatric echo quantification, adjusting measurements of cardiovascular structures for body size, also known as allometry. And then we'll spend the last half of this webinar discussing everything you ever wanted to know about Z-scores and more, namely the currently available pediatric echo nomograms and their limitations, as well as the pediatric heart network study to address some of these challenges and limitations. <laughs> 
So there's certainly been a lot of publications on on echo optimization techniques, but there are several technical factors that's definitely crucial when performing measurements in a pediatric echo. So first, um, axial measurements, which are parallel to the ultrasound beam, are always better than lateral measurements, which are perpendicular to the beam, because resolution along the axial direction is better than resolution along the lateral direction. Second, lateral resolution becomes worse with increasing distance from the probe because of beam spread. So all efforts really should be made to perform measurements from views, which are as close as possible to the structure that's being measured. And third, it's important to remember that at large image depths, the ultrasound resolution exceeds the pixel resolution of the image display. So decreasing the image depth to the minimum needed for making the measurements and using image magnification um, are always recommended. Measurements should involve multiple views and orthogonal planes, especially for non-circular structures like the atrioventricular valves. The measurements of valves should be performed at the valvar hinge points from inner edge to inner edge at the point of maximum expansion. Uh, measurements of vascular structure should be performed from inner edge to inner edge at the point of maximum expansion and perpendicular to the axis of blood flow along the vessel. So some controversies have resulted from these recommendations, and we'll discuss these in more detail when we talk about the individual protocols. Doppler optimization involves using color mapping before spectral Doppler to determine the direction of flow in the region of interest. You should use a sweep speed of 100 to 150 millimeters per second with simultaneous ECG tracing so that the timing of flow events can be correlated to electrical events. Measurements of maximum and mean gradients um, should use well-defined envelopes, excluding fuzz or feathers during the measurement. And, and when you can, they should be averaged over at least um, three cardiac cycles to account for changes in amplitude because of respiration. So our document served as a methodology paper for performing measurements, especially when acquiring data to generate a normal pediatric echo quantification database. So this is a so-called manual of operations. Again, you have to remember that these measurements are those that can be performed during a pediatric echo and not those that should be performed. The, this type of recommendation really would require more outcomes data than are currently available. So let's begin with the specific protocols by segment. In most of these discussions, I will focus specifically on the problems and challenges with some of the recommended measurements. I'm sure everyone on this call is aware of many of the uh, controversies surrounding the measurements that we perform on a daily basis in the pediatric echo lab. So let's start with the left atrium. Measurement of left atrial size, useful definitely in the assessment of left ventricular diastolic function. Although the guidelines involve 2D measurements of major and minor axis lengths as well as preliminary areas and apical four-chamber views, these measurements turn out to be actually poor predictors of left atrial volumes as measured by 3D echo. So left atrial volumes can be calculated using different methodologies as we outlined in the paper and as you can see here. And these values tend to correlate better with three-dimensional echo-derived values for left atrial volumes. Pulmonary vein Doppler interrogation, also useful, uh, particularly as it relates to left ventricular diastolic function and mitral regurgitation. But it turns out that this study from the Pediatric Heart Network, which is an NIH-funded research infrastructure for doing multi-center studies in pediatric cardiology and cardiac surgery, that this study, looking at the reproducibility of specific echo measurements, actually showed that pulmonary vein Doppler reversal during atrial systole has one of the highest percentage error when it comes to intra- and inter-observer variability and reproducibility. So not really such a great measurement to use in daily practice. Let's talk about the AV valves. The recommended method to assess atrioventricular valve size involves measuring the annular size from inner edge to inner edge at the valvar hinge points in diastole. We use orthogonal diameters as measured in apical four-chamber views and parasternal long axis views. But it turns out that apical two-chamber and three-chamber views probably provide better estimates of the orthogonal annular diameters than the apical four-chamber and parasternal long axis view. Having said that, 
Apical two-chamber view is sometimes difficult to obtain in children, and most people still use four chamber, apical four-chamber and parasternal long-axis views for these measurements. Let's go to the ventricles. Right ventricular function can be evaluated by measuring fractional area change, tricuspid annular plane systolic excursion, tissue Doppler and blood flow, blood flow spectral Doppler indices, and the myocardial performance index. But we all know that these indices of RV function are, in fact, pretty limited. We all use cardiac MRI as the gold standard for RV size and function assessment. There have been lots of studies in the past that have shown poor correlation of echo-derived right ventricular volumes to those derived from MRI. So, for example, this 1995 study from the Netherlands showed only moderate correlation between echo and MRI measurements with pretty significant systematic errors. And this more recent study from Wyman Lai and the people in Boston showed that right ventricular measurements obtained by 2D echo generally smaller than those from MRI with pretty weak correlation between the two. Now, the left ventricle has been the most studied of all of the segments. And as you'll see, there have been lots and lots of challenges and controversies. So one of these uh, controversies or challenges involves the exact timing of the measurements. In most pediatric echo labs, and diastole is defined as the point of maximal intraluminal area, and end systole the moment of minimal intraluminal area. But these designations rely on visual estimates. They usually don't involve frame-by-frame -frame analysis of the intraluminal area to determine maximum and minimum values. In addition, we really should know that during isovolumic contraction, the left, vent the left ventricular long axis first shortens then it actually elongates, whereas the left ventricular short axis first increases, then decreases. So when looking at the left ventricle and apical four chamber views, it's often difficult to completely identify the timing of maximal and minimal intraluminal area. So when appropriate, and particularly when evaluating left ventricular size in apical four chamber views, and diastole is defined as the moment when the mitral valve closes, and end systole is defined as the moment when the mitral valve, uh, the moment before the mitral valve opens. Another challenge with left ventricular size measurements uh, involves the fact that the adult quantification guidelines recommend measurements in the long axis view, partly because this assures us that all minor axis measurements are perpendicular to the long axis of the left ventricle. The pediatric quantification document, however, it recommended that left ventricular linear measurements be performed in short axis views because this assures us that the left ventricle is circular in shape. We know that the left ventricle isn't always circular, uh, particularly in the setting of congenital heart disease with varying loading conditions for the right ventricle. The other thing is the long axis view doesn't address the issue of lateral motion of the left ventricle during the cardiac cycle. So for example, this is a long axis view of a left ventricle. It doesn't have, appear to have any significant issues. Maybe the right ventricle is a little bit big, but you might think that measuring left ventricular minor axis dimensions from this view would be completely appropriate, but the short axis view does in fact show that the left ventricle is not round, but rather flattened during diastole because of significant right ventricular volume overload because there's a moderate secundum ASD in this patient. So here, measuring left ventricular dimensions in long axis views alone would be misleading and inaccurate. Here's another long axis clip. Doesn't appear significantly abnormal. So left ventricular minus minor axis dimensions could certainly be measured in this view. And again, the short axis view shows flattening of the left ventricle. This patient, in fact, has pulmonary hypertension, causing septal flattening, and again, precluding accurate estimation of left ventricular size from minor axis dimensions. So the, the short axis view is really necessary just to assure that left ventricular shape remains circular throughout the entire cardiac cycle. So the biggest source of controversy with left ventricular size measurements has been the recommendation to use only 2D linear measurements instead of M-mode measurements. I'm sure there are a lot of voodoo dolls out there in the world with the name of Leo Lopez because a lot of people were very upset with us when we took M-mode out of the quantification uh, guidelines. And the reason that people are so um, 
uh, supportive of M-Mode was that M-Mode was the standard of care for many years uh, during the 1970s and the 1980s before the availability of 2D echo. This is an early guidelines paper from the American Society of Echo published in 1978 on how to perform measurements by M-Mode. Uh, this is what people have done for many years. In fact, this review article by Harvey Feigenbaum from 2010 outlined several advantages of M-Mode over 2D when it comes to quantification. The most important advantage involves the fact that the temporal resolution with M-Mode is significantly better by orders of magnitude than the temporal resolution with 2D. So M-Mode for sure is useful for um, evaluating things like time intervals, uh, mitral valve and aortic valve motion, ventricular septal motion. And because M-Mode has been the standard for many years, a lot of people suggest that it's, in fact, ease faster and easier. But Harvey Feigenbaum, in his review article, actually stated this, that in the current era, M-Mode has limited applications because it is so heavily influenced by the availability of good acoustic windows. In addition, M-Mode has been uh, known to overestimate 2D measurements by up to 12 millimeters, it doesn't account for the lateral motion of the left ventricle during the cardiac cycle. And it's often difficult, if not impossible, to pass the M-mode line through both the septal wall and posterior wall midpoints, which is what you'd need in order to get a good diameter of the circular left ventricle. So here are two examples of M-mode tracings that depict the problem. A close-up view of the reference 2D images shows that in neither instance does the M-mode line bisect the midpoints of both the septal wall and the posterior free wall. These measurements of left ventricular dimensions would be inaccurate since they're not true minor axis diameters. And then lastly, there, there, some data have been published regarding the poor inter-observer um, reproducibility of some M-mode measurements. This study of heart function in children with HIV looked at differences between local and core laboratory measurements of left ventricular size, and they showed that a shortening fraction of 32% obtained locally could correspond to a shortening fraction, uh, shortening fraction anywhere between 20, 24 to 40% at the core laboratory. So it's pretty wide variability. The interesting thing is that this same study from the Pediatric Heart Network showed slightly better reproducibility of M-mode compared to 2D measurements. This is because the reproducibility of measurements along a single dimension, along a line as you would use in M-mode, is always going to be better than reproducibility in a two-dimensional two plane as you would use with 2D echo. The problem here is that better reproducibility, which is also known as, as um, precision, is not the same as accuracy, which is what we really want. So in any case, it turns out many people are still using M-mode uh, measurements in their labs despite our guidelines and standards recommendations. Another source of discrepancy in terms of left ventricular measurements uh, is that some labs perform only linear measurements, whereas others calculate left ventricular volumes for most of their patients. This is a paper from 1978 showing that left ventricular diameters are pretty useful surrogates of left ventricular size in patients with normal left ventricular volumes, but it doesn't work when children have LV volume overload, abnormal septal orientation, or after surgical intervention involving the ventricle. And if an echo lab uses the volumetric approach, they usually have to choose either the Simpson biplane method to calculate left ventricular volumes that uses a summation of disks method, and that's shown on the left, or the area length method as shown on the right. These approaches to calculate um, to calculating left ventricular volumes originate from work in the late 1970s, early 1980s, using cross-sectional echo in canine hearts and formalin-fixed heart specimens, and then comparing those data to left ventricular angiograms, which for many years before this provided the only way of measuring left ventricular volumes. These two studies used um, different approaches to calculating the volume of the left ventricle using the summation of disks approach. As you can see in the blue graph, uh, the formula um, for the volume of a cylinder in the orange graph, the formula for the volume of a prolate ellipsoid in the red graph, or a combination of the cylindrical and ellipsoid formula, the so-called bullet formula that you can see in the purple graph. <laughs> 
It turns out that the summation of DISCs approach and the bullet approach had the best correlations to left ventricular volumes as measured by angiography, and they had the lowest mean percent error and also are the most evenly distributed values around the mean. You can see that in the blue and in the purple graph. The cylinder approach tended to overestimate left ventricular volumes, that's the orange graph, and the ellipsoid approach tended to under, underestimate left ventricular volumes, that's the red graph. Now, it turns out that the same, again, we're back to this pediatric heart network study uh, that we talked about earlier. It showed that the area length method had a lower percentage error than the Simpson summation of disk method. So many people have actually started using the area length method to estimate um, left ventricular volumes, particularly in the setting of congenital or acquired heart disease, where um, loading conditions for the heart can be abnormal. This is the approach that we use to calculate left ventricular volumes in the Z-score project that we're going to talk about at the end of this presentation. It also turns out that at least in children, there's good correlation between left ventricular volumes measured by the area length method and left ventricular volumes measured by MRI. So now let's look at aortic annular size, which is measured at the valvar hinge points in systole in parasternal long axis views. This is the typical parasternal long axis image that we see in our, uh, when we're doing this evaluation. So remember that the aortic valve is attached within the aortic root in a semilunar fashion. So when we measure the annulus at the valvar hinge points, um, we, we're actually measuring uh, a, a, a diameter from the most proximal attachment of the right coronary cusp to, to the most proximal attachment of the non-coronary cusp or, or leaflet. But if you think about it, because there are three leaflets that make up the aortic valve, the widest diameter of the aortic annulus would have to extend from a commissure to the central attachment of the opposing cusp. So you just have to know that what we call aortic annular diameter is, in fact, not the widest diameter of the aortic valve at the level of the ventricular arterial junction. The other thing is this term aortic annulus is, in fact, a, diagnost a diagnostician construct based on echo images, which don't actually have a true anatomic correlate since the aortic valve is attached in a three-dimensional semilunar fashion at the ventricular arterial junction up into the aortic root. It's not like the um, annulus defined for the atrioventricular valves because the tricuspid and mitral valves are, in fact, circumferentially attached throughout the entire atrioventricular junction. How about the aortic root? <laughs> We recommended that the aortic root diameter be measured from inner edge to inner edge along a line that's perpendicular to the long axis of the vessel at the point of maximum expansion. No surprise that there are also several points of controversy with these recommendations. So the adult quantification um, guidelines actually recommend that measurements be performed from one leading edge to the other leading edge, which in essence represents a measurement from the proximal outer edge to the distal inner edge, mostly because this practice evolved from the M-mode era. In, in addition, this is the recommended approach in many published echo studies, um, including the Roman nomograms that many of us used to determine whether an aorta was dilated, particularly in the setting of Marfan syndrome. Controversy also exists in terms of the timing of the measurements. The pediatric quantification document recommends that measurements be performed in systole at the point of maximum expansion. So first of all, we know that there are significant differences between systolic and diastolic measurements of the aorta, as shown by this study uh, from Sydney, Australia. So the adult quantification um, document recommends that the aorta be measured during diastole. Again, because the M-mode guidelines recommended measurements during diastole, mostly because image resolution with M-mode was better during diastole. And then again, the, the Roman nomograms are also based on diastolic measurements. However, because the maximum effect of vessel size on vessel function occurs at peak flow, so that's during systole, and peak systolic wall stress, um, which occurs at the point of peak systolic pressure, is the biggest determinant of dissection in patients with aortic dilation. The pediatric quantification document recommended measurements of the aorta during systole, primarily because the clinical significance of these values appeared to be more important. It turns out, um, however, that a very recent study published in JACE 
suggest that the differences between systolic and diastolic measurements of the aorta in adults may not be clinically significant, <clears throat> even if the differences are statistically significant. We're going to talk about this issue of statistical um, versus <clears throat> clinical significance some more later on in this presentation. And lastly, aortic root shape also can cause some problems. This shows you how one would measure the aortic root diameter from parasternal long axis views. <clears throat> Remember that the aortic root represents the widest diameter at the sinuses of Valsalva. The problem is that the aortic root is not actually circular in shape, as you can see in the short axis MRI image. <clears throat> you can imagine how discrepancies can occur depending on where in this clover leaf shape one measures the aortic root diameter. All right, so now we're going to shift gears and talk about normal reference values and z scores. You always have to remember that children are not little adults, um, and adult reference values for the sizes of cardiovascular structures usually don't apply to children because the heart grows in size as the child grows in size. So here are two examples of how the average diameters of the aortic annulus and the ascending aorta um, increase in normal people as the body surface area increases or as the child ages. So allometry is the study of how the sizes of body organs increase as the total body size increases. Let me show you why this is important. Hopefully everyone here recognizes that this ascending aorta is dilated. This is, in fact, a patient with a bicuspid aortic valve. It's not unusual to have a dilated ascending aorta in this scenario. It almost doesn't matter if this is a child or an adult because you can see that the ascending aorta is big. Hopefully, um, everyone here also recognizes that this is a really small ascending aorta in the setting of hypoplastic left heart syndrome. Pretty straightforward. What about this aorta? If I told you this was a three-year-old and I also gave you the measurement value, you might know that it was normal. But the same value may not be normal for a one-month-old or for a 16-year-old. This is why it's important to look at all measurement values in the context of age, body size, and possibly other confounding factors. Let's think about this another way. We know that the sizes of cardiovascular structures are affected by the abnormal hemodynamics of certain disease states. So, for example, the left ventricle is often big, dilated in patients with a ventricular septal defect. In tetralogy fellow, the pulmonary arteries are often small. But we also know that body size plays a role, and maybe age, genetics, sex, race, as well as other potential confounding factors that are listed here. But it's the effect of total body size that we'll focus on primarily, since this is the most relevant confounding factor when dealing with kids. You'll understand the rationale for this when I talk about the Pediatric Heart Network Z-score study at the end of this presentation. So. When looking at cardiovascular structures, it turns out that body surface area is the best parameter to measure total body growth. It's better than just height or weight alone. So BSA is usually the recommended parameter when adjusting measurements for the effects of body size. A common practice in, in, in pediatric cardiology and cardiac surgery involves indexing measurements to body surface area in order to account for the effects of allometry. This practice evolved from the known direct relationship between cardiac output and body surface area. But because cardiac output is also directly related to the sizes of cardiovascular structures, it's easy to extrapolate these relationships to a, to a direct linear relationship between body surface area and the sizes of all cardiovascular structures. This is the so-called indexing of measurements to BSA used in clinical practice and in research studies. There's so many problems with this, but the most obvious one involves the fact that BSA can't be linearly related to length and to area and to volume measurements all at the same time. This is just mathematically impossible. So what we really need to do is to develop some uh, mathematical description of the mean behavior of a specific measurement in terms of body size over the full range of body sizes encountered in pediatrics. And this mathematical formula has to work regardless of how big or how old the patient is. <clears throat> 
The next issue involves the term heteroskedasticity. I love saying this word, but I promise I won't use it again in this presentation. So heteroskedasticity represents the phenomenon of changing or non-constant variance. That is, there's a persistent dependence of the adjusted value on the independent parameter. So what do I mean by that? And, and, and why is this important? So we saw previously this, this linear relationship um, between aortic annular diameter and body surface area. When the aortic annular diameter is actually adjusted for body surface area, as you can see on the graph on the right, um, it, that's diameter divided by body surface area, what you see is that the adjusted value decreases with increasing body surface area. There's a persistent relationship between the adjusted value and body surface area the adjusted value is still dependent on BSA. So the formula of diameter divided by BSA will make it look like the patient's aorta is getting relatively smaller as he or she becomes bigger. Now, if you use some transformation of the body size parameter, so in this instance, the square root of body surface area, that sometimes fixes the problem. So here you see that there's still a linear relationship between aortic annular diameter and the square root of BSA, but plotting the um, diameter divided by the square root of BSA against increasing body size along the x-axis results in a horizontal line, a zero slope. There's no residual dependence of the adjusted value on BSA. So the mathematical descriptor for this particular measurement doesn't change with increasing body size. So that's, that's actually very important. Um, and so what you want to do is find the best exponent value for BSA that doesn't result in a residual relationship between the adjusted value and BSA. It turns out that the square root of body surface area tends to be best for uh, the best parameter for linear distance measurements like aortic annular diameter. And that body surface area um, is best for area measurements and then body air, surface area to the power of 1.5 or some number near 1.5 for volumetric measurements. You'll see why this concept is important when we talk about the Pediatric Heart Network Z-Score project. What you also need to know is how close your measurement value is from the mean value for that particular body size. So in statistical terms, how many standard deviations of value is from the mean? Z-scores represent the number of standard deviations a measurement is, a specific measurement is, from the mean value at that particular body surface area. Z-scores of minus two and plus two represent two standard deviations below and above the mean, and then have really generally been designated as the traditional limits of normal for any given population. So an aortic root z-score greater than two, that is two standard deviations above the mean, in the setting of Marfan syndrome represents aortic root dilation. A left ventricular end diastolic volume less than minus two likely represents some degree of left ventricular hypoplasia. So the currently available nomograms or databases of normal measurements that are in use have involved echo measurements from normal children at major clinical centers. These are the most frequently used databases from Boston, from Detroit Children's Hospital, from Cincinnati, from National Children's Medical Center in Washington, D.C. The databases are easily accessible through a website called Parameter Z that lists the publications from which the normal values originate and provides normal um, reference values for the most common echo measurements, as well as fetal measurements uh, and, fun and functional parameters like TAPSI, it allows you to upload an app that you can use on your iPad or smartphone uh, so that you can actually have access to these normal values all the time. This is another app um, which was developed by John Simpson and his group in London called Cardio Z that allows quick access to normal reference values for common 2D and Doppler echo measurements as well as um, other clinical parameters like height, weight, uh, BSA, blood pressure. Uh, it also has additional features like um, providing you with a PDF summary of your measurements, following trends for specific patients, calculating body surface area with different methods. So in the last 25 to 30 years, there have been at least 30 published pediatric nomograms of common echo measurements. This review paper that was published in 2012 looked at the limitation in these databases. 
Here you can see the major problem with the currently available nomograms. In a boy with a body surface area of 0.3 meters squared and a mitral annular diameter of 11 millimeters, uh, it, it actually co corresponds to an incredibly wide range of z-scores from minus 4.8 to plus 2.5, and people are making clinical decisions based on one of these nomograms. Notice the N in these studies. Part of the problem is that the sample sizes in these studies are often small with few data on neonates. They're mostly from single clinical centers and most don't adjust for sex and race. We already suggested that these factors may play an important confounding role in the size of the cardiovascular structures. The problem is that you would need a pretty big sample size in order to really see if race plays an important role in the growth of cardiovascular structures. So another issue involves the fact that statistical significance doesn't necessarily imply clinically relevant significance, especially since outcome studies to determine the true effect of, of um, statistically significant abnormalities are actually, these outcome studies are actually pretty rare in pediatrics. So for instance, an aortic root z-score of plus two is definitely not the threshold for medical therapy or surgical intervention in patients with a dilated aorta. In fact, the clinical threshold values for intervention are usually higher and are actually different for each particular disorder, whether it's Marfan syndrome or Lois Dietz syndrome or Tetralogy of Fallot. The other issue that we alluded to when talking about systolic and diastolic aortic measurements is that Studies with massive sample sizes can easily find statistically significant differences in the analyses that may not necessarily be clinically significant. So we're going to talk about that issue some more in a bit. So beyond the problems with measurements, the method of normalization or adjustment for body size can also vary, making interpretation of the data sometimes confusing. This paper um, looked at 52 studies uh, reporting normal reference values and showed that the most common method for normalization involved indexing or, or using some um, sort of linear or nonlinear regression equation. What's interesting is that heteroskedasticity was addressed in only 27% of the studies, showing just how limited these studies can be. And I'm sorry I used that word again. This is another important factor. There's at least five different ways to calculate body surface area. You can see how varied um, these formulas are. At least one of these formulas is based on less than 10 study subjects, none of whom were children. And the different formulas can actually lead to discrepant index values, especially at the extremes of body size in the really small and really big kids. And then lastly, the body size parameter use can be important. Here's a graph showing just how predictive left ventricular mass is for adverse cardiovascular events and death. But there's, there's a lot of controversy right now as to whether left ventricular mass should be normalized only to height, which means ignoring the effects of fat, especially in the obese population, or, or normalizing to body surface area, which overemphasizes the effect of fat mass. So you can imagine how difficult it might be to evaluate the effects of normalized left ventricular mass on outcomes if we can't even agree on how to normalize the values. We actually looked at this in our obese population. When I was at Montefiore, New York, um, in general practice, people who calculate left ventricular mass using M-mode measurements adjust the measurements for height, and those who calculate left ventricular mass using 2D echo measurements adjust for the effects of body surface area. Using these two approaches to evaluate the prevalence of left ventricular hypertrophy in our obese population, the prevalence of LVH with the M-mode height method was 64% and the prevalence using the 2D BSA method was 0%. So clearly there's a problem here. And just to be sure that, um, that a bias wasn't created with pairing specific measurement approach with a normalization approach, we cross-analyzed the different methodologies. Um, and although there appears to be a difference in results between the two methods of measurement, there's still a marked difference in prevalence based on the normalization approach suggesting that we just haven't gotten it right yet. And the correct approach lies somewhere in between these. So in the last few minutes, I'm going to talk about our recent pediatric heart network study to develop a new Z-score database in a multi-center structure with a, a very large sample size so that we can account for the effects of not only age and sex, but also race and ethnicity. Our primary aim was to determine if Z-scores for common pediatric echo measurements adjusted for body surface area are significantly affected by age, sex, race, or ethnicity. Healthy children with available height, 
weight, sex, and race data were eligible for enrollment. We also collected ethnicity data, in other words, Hispanic versus non-Hispanic when it was available. Uh, exclusion criteria were significant structural or congenital heart disease, prematurity, obesity, and acute or chronic systemic disorder with known cardiovascular associations, and a first degree um, relative with either non ischemic cardiomyopathy or left sided congenital heart disease. The study involved retrospective data collection from 19 centers. 36 study groups were created based on six age categories, two sex categories, three race categories, whites, African Americans, and another race category for a target sample size of 3,600. Once the data were collected, we chose the body surface ex uh, area exponent for each measurement based on these criteria, that there's a linear relationship between the measurement and the transformed BSA, there's no residual relationship between the adjusted value and BSA with a slope that's equal to zero and that the index measurement is normally distributed so that we can actually calculate z-scores. We, uh, we performed multivariable linear regression analyses for each parameter looking for the effects of age, sex, race, and ethnicity. All statistically significant effects were then tested for clinical significance by comparing raw measurement values from models with the significant effects and models without the effects. If the difference was less than 5%, then we considered that effect to be clinically insignificant. So we chose this threshold of 5% because the reproducibility of echo measurements has been reported as inter and intra observer differences of 5% of or more or more for most measurements. Because we had such a large sample size in our study, it was easy for a lot of the components of our analyses to be statistically significant. So in an effort, effort, in an effort to distinguish clinical significance from statistical significance in this very large database, we assumed that differences in predicted raw measurement values from different models in our analyses that were less than 5% could very easily be attributable to measurement error rather than a true clinically significant difference. And you'll see why this is important in a little bit. So we enrolled 3,566 subjects, 90% of them had measurable echo images, giving us a total of 3,215 study subjects for the analyses. Because of this large study sample size, we found statistically significant effects by age, sex, and or race for all of the index parameters. But when we compared models with and without these statistically significant effects, we found no clinically significant effects of age, sex, race, and ethnicity on all of our index parameters. This really represents our most important finding. These are a very busy table showing you the mathematical description of each parameter with the body surface area transformation exponent, the mean value of the index parameter, and the standard deviation. The important part is that you would use this formula to calculate the z-score of a measurement for a subject with a particular body surface area using the values from the tables. And if you don't want to use the formula, you can use the old-fashioned approach and just plot your measurement on the distribution graph of the raw measurements across the full range of BSA. Then you can see whether your measurement falls um, within the range of normal, in other words, between the two standard deviations above and below the mean. And these are some of the other parameters that were evaluated in our study. So from our data, we concluded that body surface area raised to an appropriate exponential power is a good parameter to use for, for cardiovascular allometric scaling to account for the effects of body size on the sizes of cardiovascular structures. The effects of age, sex, race, and ethnicity on the adjusted values are clinically insignificant. So with our data, we've determined z-scores for common pediatric echo measurements that are based on body surface area alone. And we're actually developing an online z-score calculator that will soon be available on the Pediatric Heart Network website. So for our original patient from, that we talked about with the wide range of z-scores, you would use the data for mitral annular diameter on the z-score calculator. You would enter the height and weight to calculate the body surface area. And after you enter the diameter measurement, uh, in this instance, 11 millimeters, the z-score calculator will provide the z-score and percentile for this particular uh, patient, as well as the mean measurement value and range for a patient of this size. So in summary, there, there are many challenges and many controversies with the current protocols 
for pediatric echo quantification. I realize that by the end of this talk, no one's going to want to perform any more measurements because of all of the problems that I mentioned. I, I think it's just really important for everyone to recognize that there are limitations to the things that we do. And that's why we always need to take any measurements within the context of the clinical scenario when possible. And because we're dealing with children, echo measurements should always be adjusted for body size. Um, although age, sex, and race are not clinically significant confounding factors, there may be other confounders that we just haven't studied yet, like, um, like, like nutrition, exercise, altitude, for example. In addition, most published reference values are limited by small sample sizes and really very um, heterogeneous um, uh, methodologies. Um, and, and lastly, we now have a large database of... Um, we, we now have a large database of echo measurements and z-scores from normal children using standardized methodology. Is this better than the other commonly used z-scores? I don't think we can actually answer that question. We certainly proved that sex and race don't make a difference, and that's actually very important. We're currently comparing our z-scores to some of the other published z-scores, and we're hoping to publish those data sometime in the next six, six to 12 months. So hopefully we'll have better answers in a bit. Um, but I think we, we all should be happy that now um, we don't have to worry about uh, age, sex, and race whenever we're looking at z-scores. Thank you very much for your attention. Okay, thank you very much. And at this time, we will begin the Q&A session. From IAC ECHO, I'd like to introduce our senior clinical specialists, Sandy DePetris and Sue Jensen. Sandy and Sue will be assisting with the Q&A session today. Sandy, would you like to start us off? Sure, Kelly. Thank you. Dr. Lopez, there really aren't very many questions yet, but I have one that's interesting. Um, Josh asks, is the Simpson volume method sensitive for newborns with a BSA as low as 0.2? So that, that's a good question, and I, I don't know if anybody has the answer to that because there hasn't been a lot of, of evaluation of the variability of measurements like the Simpson biplane uh, calculation of left ventricular volumes and area length for, uh, based on the size of the patient. So I, 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 I don't know the, the real answer, except that you, you have to be very careful of any type of measurement that you make in the in neonates and infants, partly because we're dealing with much smaller structures, so the level of error in the measurement is going to be higher. The other thing is there is some um, level of error associated with making measurements of height, of the length of moving babies, right? And so um, a lot of people actually question whether or not BSA is valuable in, in, in infants and, and neonates because of the, the variability in height. So I don't know if I actually answered your question, but you, you know, the, 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 the point here is that you have to be careful because of those two limitations. Okay, Dr. Lopez, um, Abraham actually has two questions, and this is the first one. Why do we assume that MRI-derived data for non-volume measurements are truly better than echo measurements? Is there outcome data that supports this? We know that the answer to that is there are no outcomes data, particularly in measurements involving children, because it would take a, a tremendous amount of data collection in order to do that. The reason our adult colleagues are able to, to, to actually derive outcome, outcomes measurements is because they have, the, you know, they're dealing with much larger population sample sizes than we do in pediatrics. So, so the answer is, I don't, I don't completely know why we're using MRI, except that, that, that those data tend to be more reproducible than data that's collected in other ways, like angiograms, like echo, um, and things like that. So, so you're right to question um, why, you know, why we're using MRI as the gold standard. The other thing is, as, as people who do MRI know, is that there's also variability on how you make those measurements, depending on whether you're taking trabeculations or not taking trabeculations, papillary muscle groups, all of those things play a role in the variability that you get with MRI. Okay. Um, his second question is, does it matter if a measurement is the true measurement? For example, for aortic root diameters, why is measuring a non-circular diameter any better than a repeatable echo measurement? 
always making the echo measurements using the same reference point? I love that question because that's actually the question we should all be asking all the time. Uh, how important is truth, right? So I think at the end of the day, when we make these measurements, so what, when, when we make any kind of measurements in the echo lab, there are two things we're doing. We're comparing it to all other individuals that have similar traits. So the same age, the same body size, those sorts of things, right? So we're comparing that. But the other part of that that's even probably more important clinically is we're using that number to follow trends over time. You know, we want to know if the aorta is getting bigger over time for a particular patient. And so, so the truth may not be as important there as long as the methodology stays constant and consistent every time you make the measurement. And in fact, this is also true for the other part of this, you know, the other side of this, in that, in that if all of your measurements are done exactly the same way, then you can certainly compare them with each other and know when one is big and one is small compared to the other ones within your database. So, so I guess my, my point here is that, that all of these measurements and all of these Z-scores, you know, there, there, there are lots of Z-scores out there, and I'm not telling people to start, stop using one Z-score and use another Z-score at this point. What I'm saying is that you have to know that when you're changing your methodology to make the measurement or your methodology to, to actually calculate Z-scores, that you're not actually going to be following the trend in, in, in an appropriate fashion. Okay, Michael asks, are you using any M-mode measurements in your lab or just Z-scores? And if you are using M-modes, which ones? So, so I, I think the question probably is, are we using M modes as opposed to 2D measurements? So I have to, I have to confess that we're using both. Um, most of the time, we're using 2D measurements in order to calculate our Z-scores um, because that's what, that's what our Z-scores are based on. But there are times when we use M modes. So, yeah, I'm one of those people that still occasionally turns to M mode to do it, partly because it's hard to change people's habits. Okay, um, Sheila asks, if she's understanding correctly, if measuring vessel sizes, we get more accuracy using BSA squared, and when measuring volumes, it's best to use just the BSA. So, so you'll see in the, in the Pediatric Heart Network paper that for, for, di for diameters, any kind of diameters, whether it's vessel size or left ventricular diameters, the best um, transformation of body surface area is the square root of body surface area. But when you're looking at volumetric measurements, it's actually body surface area to the power of like anywhere from 1.3 to 1.6, depending, depending on what uh, worked out best during our, our statistical analysis of that, of that particular parameter. But, but yes, it, it's a different transformation of body surface area for different types of measure, for, for linear measurements as opposed to volumetric measurements. Um, Shannon asks, is it better when you're measuring to measure during inspiration or expiration, or does that matter? Um, so that's a good question. I would say that the best, the best time to measure, to make a measurement, is when you have the best possible picture. So if inspiration or expiration plays a role in the quality of the image, then you should definitely use the, the best possible picture. Um, the other, the other thing is, and this is why, you know, we recommended 2D echo as opposed to M mode. You know, there's certain, there's lateral motion, for example, of the left ventricle, uh, because of respiratory variations. And so sometimes you, you're not able to capture that with M mode and it's easier to capture sort of that, that translation of the left ventricle, the short axis of the left ventricle, uh, during the respiratory cycle by just looking at 2D echo images. So, you know, it, so the, 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 the answer is it doesn't matter, I don't think, um, as long as you're being consistent when you're making the measurements and also as long as you're finding the best possible picture to make the measurement in. Okay. All right. Susanna asks, could Z-score be used in a young adult with CHD? So that's a good question also. Our Z-scores um, only go up to 18 years of age. Um, there are some Z-scores available for young adults um, that are, are available with some of the other Z-score databases. 
So you just have to know that the moment you start using the Z-score, particularly the Pediatric Heart Network Z-score database, when you start using that on subjects that aren't older, that it may not necessarily reflect the true normal behavior of that particular structure at that particular age, because we really only looked at patients up to 18. Uh, I'm saying that because there are people that will use, you know, sort of the the highest body surface area or the highest age when calculating Z-scores for subjects, even though they're older. Um, and, 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 you know, that's often the way that people will say, well, yeah, that aorta is big when compared to 18-year-olds. That aorta is big for this 25-year-old when compared to aortas in an, you know, aortas in an 18-year-old. Um, you know, I think eventually we will know how much change is occurring after 18 for a lot of the cardiovascular structures. There's certainly a lot of work being done right now to collect aortic data, for example, uh, up to very, very, um, to, to older, older people up in the 60s and 70s. This is, I think, being done in Italy or France. You know, so we'll have those data eventually available. Right now, they're not. Okay, and let's be asked about how long have people been using Z-scores in pediatric labs? Gosh. Um, so Z-scores have been around since statistical analysis have, has, been, has been sort of a science in and of itself. Um, we were using Z-scores when I was in Boston in my training during the, ninth, uh, this is giving away my age, but during the late 1980s, we were using Z-scores. Um, so I don't actually know when, when they became available. I know for sure, like the Roman nomograms was, uh, that I showed, you know, the ones uh, looking at aortic size uh, over the range of body surface area, a lot of people were using that for many, many years um, before Z-scores were available just because Z-scores weren't there. Uh, and, and so, you know, I think certainly in the 1970s, I don't think people were using them then, but I, I don't know that for sure. Okay. Um... Lee wants to know if there are currently any studies on LV size in infants at high altitudes. <laughs> All right. So, so there are no studies looking at altitude as a confounding factor, and I think that's a very important question. Um, there are studies looking at left ventricular size in infants, period. Uh, there's still some limitations in some of those uh, because most most of the most of the projects, most of the studies that have been published, really didn't look at a whole lot of infants. Um, that's why we we you know we were very um, uh, focused in our our data collection and enrollment for this pediatric heart network study to make sure that we included a lot of subjects between the age of zero to one month of age, uh, because, because we wanted to gather those data on, on infants um, that have not really been examined that as carefully in previous studies. But as far as altitude, uh, there, there's nothing, you know, I, I, I threw that out. Like, I don't think anybody's really looked at the effect of altitude, the effect of nutrition, the effect of exercise on the sizes of cardiovascular structures. Okay, Kurt asks, <clears throat> what about the work that the Boston group is doing with BMI and LV mass? How does that compare with your data on the BSA calculations? So I have to admit that left ventricular mass has been the, one of the most controversial parts of our study. Right, because a lot of people are so dependent on on um, how to normalize left ventricular mass in order to make uh, a, a diagnosis of left ventricular hypertrophy, and most of the studies out there looking at left ventricular hypertrophy have used height as as the index. Um, so Boston is is looking not just at BMI, but it's looking at lean body mass. Boston and, and several other centers, a lot of a lot of, of centers are now looking at this. They're looking at BMI. They're looking at lean body mass um, as a way to see if we can find better predictors of how how much left ventricular mass is going to increase as a patient gets older or bigger. Um, and so. So, so yes, that's that's a very important question, and it is something that we are also going to address with our data um, um, at the Pediatric Heart Network, um, is to look specifically at other body size parameters and their predictive ability um, for for some of the measures that we use. But you can see why lean body mass would be something that's useful, right? Because because uh, Really, at the end of the day, it's lean body mass that helps determine what 
what cardiac output an individual needs, right? Not not the amount of fat that there is and not, you know, any of the other other that's why when when we talked about BSA and height and the prevalence of left ventricular hypertrophy, there was such a wide range because I think the answer is somewhere in the middle where lean body mass sits. All right. Well thank you very much and a very special thank you to Dr. Lopez for today's presentation. Please feel free to contact IAC ECHO with any questions that were not answered during the Q&A session. To receive continuing education credit for attending this webinar, please complete the survey. The survey will appear on your screen automatically at the conclusion of this live session and also be available from the IAC webinars portal for three business days. On the left side of the My Account page, you'll click on Webinars. Look for the title of this session, Pediatric Echo Quantification to Z or Not to Z. Beneath this title, you will see the button Attend Event. Click this button, then the Evaluation tab. Then click Take Evaluation to complete the survey. Your certificate can then be accessed and printed from the very next screen and anytime thereafter through the CE Transcript section on the My Account page. If you have any questions about the survey, please contact us at webinars at intersocietal.org. Once again, we thank you for joining us today and appreciate your participation.